I hereby introduce to you Mr. Michael Veazey. Hey amazing FBS, welcome back to the show. And today I wanna to talk about something which I don't think is being talked about enough. And that is to acknowledge the reality of what you're dealing with with Amazon, right? Now, the first thing I wanna say is I don't wanna be all negative and uh, that's not what I'm about. I'm about a reality check. Reality is actually not a negative thing. If you deal with it in the right way, it will actually mean you win real wins, right? So not in your head feeling good about life for three months and then it all goes, you know, pear-shaped, but actually, um, you know, winning, long term making real profit making a real active genuine sustainable business and a genuine sustainable change to your entire life right but the cost for that is being willing to deal with reality not the fantasy that you would prefer to have right so the first thing i want to say is it's positive to be realistic right realistic has a bad name sometimes a lot of uh, styles of, of coaching and selling amazon courses are a little bit too happy happy for my taste and not because you shouldn't be positive yes positivity is very important confidence is very important and maybe typical brit i could do with being more positive and more confident i'm absolutely sure that's true right having said that though i think getting in touch with reality in a with a business like head on is a great strength so caveat to one side let me just say first of all that amazon is treating me well at the moment so i've recently sold just with one product alone i had sold 81 units yesterday at about a 30 percent margin which isn't amazing but it's pretty decent and then on cyber monday i sold 103 units of that i think we sold i don't know what 700 units or something in, in a couple of weeks so that's good i've got product landed i've just had the the um, ups guy collect some stuff um, 10 packages of a brand new product with a brand new business that's going off to Amazon UK. So it's all happening and I'm happy and I'm enjoying it and it's great being an Amazon entrepreneur, right? So I wanted to say that because what I'm gonna say is gonna shock a few people because they're not really thinking clearly and I wanted to put this out there so you really think clearly about what you're doing. And the reason this has become clear to me is working in great detail um, with mentoring clients of whom I have generally between about six and eight at any given point. Um, so just starting with a lot of new people right now. And uh, by the way, if that interests you, you can check it out on the blog, amazingfba.com forward slash mentoring. And it tells you about the costs and you know, whatever. I mean, I'm not doing a hard pitch for that because it's only for those who are serious and really ambitious and have got decent capital, at least $10,000 to spend, I think probably more these days on capital, uh, on inventory alone, I should say. So I mean actual products in addition to advertising costs and then in addition to any costs they spend on training and stuff. So here what I'm saying is for serious people, but even those people, some of whom are very, very intelligent. I mean, you know, I've got members of the mastermind also who um, have some delusions, I, I believe, about how Amazon works. And some of them are dead intelligent. I've got three members of PhD, three members of the mastermind with PhD, so they're doctors of uh, philosophy or whatever. And I've also got people who've been selling online for years and other people who do consulting themselves uh, or work in the financial market. So bright people. And even they don't really quite get the nature of Amazon. But when I break it down for people, especially if they work in other investment circles, they get it pretty quickly. So here's what I have to say that um, any investment and or business, and now two sides of the same thing, any investment of, of money and time and efforts um, or any investment purely of money in, in a, in a pre-existing business, um, is in order to get some kind of return, right? And there is normally a ratio between the sort of return you expect to get and the sort of risk you're prepared to run, right? So if, for example, you simply want to keep your uh, money just about proof from inflation, so in real terms, not growing, but at least not being eaten away by inflation, which is the worst case scenario, so you just put it under the mattress, it will gradually decrease in value as inflation erodes its value. And normally inflation is about 3% a year, so over two, 20 odd years, it will halve in value, right? Now, if you have bonds, for example, um, treasuries, US treasuries, so government bonds from the US, or gilts, which are government bonds from the UK, they will tend over time to keep pace with inflation. In, in some periods, they will increase more than that. In some cases, they will increase less, right? This isn't an investment podcast, nor do I claim to be an expert in investing, but it's kind of an obvious uh, comparison point. Now, if you invest in the stock market as a whole, my understanding is that you'll get about 12% per year in um, nominal terms. In other words, if you put um, £100,000 into a stock market investment now, on average, over the last, whatever, several decades in the US or the UK, you would expect to make 12% a year, so double in about six years to £200,000, right? There's not guaranteed in any given five or six or 10 year period, obviously. Now, here's the thing. Um, 
After inflation, that is going to end up being about 8 or 9% per year. Right now, that is a riskier thing. It's perceived as riskier. If you go to uh, the point of investing in individual shares, that's perceived as pretty high risk, but potentially high reward if you get it right. And that's what venture capitalists will do is invest at the next level of risk instead of investing in um, FTSE 100, uh, you know, so-called blue chip uh, shares of FTSE 250 or Standard & Poor's 500, so the big companies, the really, really, really huge companies, they will go another level of risk higher and in order to get another level of reward, and venture capitalists will invest, say in 10, at any given point, about 10 startup companies from scratch. Now that is seen as very high risk, but it's potentially very high reward if they get it right, okay? Now, that gives us some context in which to place Amazon as if you've got a business that primarily depends on Amazon as a sales and marketing channel. Now, how would you place that in relation to the things I've just talked about, right? Just because you're building a business doesn't mean it isn't a business and you shouldn't therefore think of it as an investable asset. So in other words, you really should approach everything as a business and you should approach every investment as a potential business and look at the business underlying the asset. For example, if you invest in Coca-Cola, look at, look at the business of soft drinks, you know, and, and the the on the one hand the rivals and the competition and government legislation pushing against advertising for high sugar products and on the other hand look at the opportunities that come from expanding internationally and and so forth right so i digress slightly but if we come back to looking at your business as an investable asset then you start to compare it with other investment opportunities out there in a more sane way right so it's really obvious coming back to my question that if a venture capitalist will invest in a business which has already got some proven um, market traction and they would see that as a high risk, high reward investment, then Amazon is a really high reward but really pretty high risk thing, right? So having your own business at only on one sales channel where Amazon is famously pretty fussy and can su shut your account down um, on the basis of pretty small things. Um, is a high risk. The rewards can be fantastic. I'm experiencing that right now for myself in quarter four. So please don't get me wrong, right? The rewards are real, so are the risks. So that insight has profound ramifications for how you deal with Amazon. For example, is running your own Amazon business simply a good replacement for your day job income? If you're bored with your corporate life or you're fed up with it or you don't feel fulfilled, you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur or you feel like you want to spend more time with your family, all those very understandable reasons. Is having an Amazon business a viable alternative to having a paycheck? Right, Because a lot of people advertise it that way. Right, And my answer is no, it isn't. Why? Because a paycheck comes from that comes from full-time employment anyway is relatively secure. Now, it's not entirely secure. Your company could decide to fire you if you piss your boss off. That happens. Your company could downsize because they're being, you know, for example, Amazon is taking their business. That happens as well, in which case then um, you'll be made redundant. So it's not entirely safe and it's good to recognize that. So I wouldn't ever want to have one income stream on which I depend anyway, even if that is a relatively secure one. Um, but I certainly want to replace a very secure income stream with a very, very uncertain one that is under, to some extent, somebody else's control still, right? It's under Amazon's control, not under your boss's control, but still. Amazon's rather pickier than your boss in some ways and also don't have to obey the letter of the law with employment law does not apply to Amazon. Amazon decides to let you have a seller account not as a legal right, but as a privilege that is under their control and which they can revoke when they decide, right? So the first thing to say is I don't think you should ever just replace your day job with Amazon. I personally have kept a bit of music coaching on. I really enjoy the stuff I'm doing. Now I'm getting rid of the last couple of people that I don't enjoy working with, um, but I, have n I make no apology whatsoever for having some off offline and off Amazon income because I think it's just a sensible diversification risk right I think it's risk diversification rather I think it's just a sensible thing to do right also obviously I earn a lot of my money on online now from Amazon which I'm lucky enough to do but also some from the podcast now podcast is very very linked with Amazon but it's not the exact same thing right I'm just in the process also of exploring uh, working with other people helping get their products to market as well so I am gradually diversifying my income streams I have a, a bit of property as well not very much again I'm not a property guru I'm not claiming expertise in that but it's another string to my bow so that if one income stream packs up I have at least got other ones that I can use uh, in the worst case to live on but in the best case at least to, to keep bringing capital into my life so that I can re redeploy that as well 
So that's the first thing to say. So if you're wanting to give your day job up, then great, get your Amazon business going. But I would also have a property portfolio if you have it. And if you have some other sort of day job type work, I wouldn't give it up in a hurry. Apart from anything else, you need to get money for inventory for Amazon. Amazon is like any inventory based business, a very capital intensive type of business, just the, the similar way to property. But it's not quite as intensive as property in that you need 30,000, 40,000 pounds probably in one go to, to get into property investment. Now, I may be wrong about that. I'm not a property expert. Maybe you can get away with less. But Amazon, just because the capital is in smaller sort of lumps, instead of one big lump, as it were, £30,000 deposit for a house or a flat or whatever the hell it is, um, it maybe is, is sort of one, you know, one or two dollars per widget. But by the time you've got a decent sized order of widgets and freighted them to the US and got them advertised and ranked them and what have you, you know, it doesn't come in at, you know, a couple of thousand pounds, not if you're doing it properly, not private label, right? Now, there are multiple alternative business models to private label, which are less risky and less capital intensive. Most importantly, retail arbitrage, which recently a colleague of mine uh, talked about in depth with my mastermind members. And uh, that is not something that's publicly shared. And I'm not going to be able to share that with you because uh, that was the agreement that I made with my friend. He's got his own retail arbitrage business and he is not going to be revealing the secrets of it anytime soon. So um, if you, by the way, you want access to really exclusive content like that, then you have to come and join the mastermind. So if you want to find out about that and you can get access to London once a month, then you can check that out on the blog, amazingfba.com forward slash mastermind. Okay. But coming back to Amazon. So this all sounds like doom and gloom. I don't think it is. I think it's fine. I think you've got to recognize that Amazon is an amazing place to grow your capital swiftly. I don't think it's a great way of replacing your day job income in and of itself. I think it can be part of the mix. Uh, along with property and or sort of some kind of employment, whether self-employed or full, or full-time or part-time employment by somebody else and other businesses. And I do think that uh, Amazon is an incredible opportunity, but let's talk about the risk management then. Once we recognize that something's risky, instead of burying our heads in the sand like, like um, children, really, and not dealing with things in reality, then we can actually deal with reality and we can mitigate risk because this is what any sensible person should do. So you want to increase the reward and decrease the, the risk so you get that ratio in your favor, right? So in the case of Amazon, what are the risks? Well, the biggest risk of all is account suspension. Um, so therefore, you should take great care of the things that can affect your account. So the first is you got to probably play within the rules now. Uh, I, along with a lot of Amazon entrepreneurs a couple of years ago when we started in this game, uh, pushed it quite hard with the rules and Amazon just kind of occasionally gave us a slap wrist. Now they're starting to suspend accounts. So when it comes to incentivized, re incentivized reviews, for example, take care that you're not um, appearing to incentivize anyone for a review. Just be very, very cautious around that. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but that's one risk area. Another one is Amazon's rather crazily perfectionist policy around so-called defect rate. And all a defect means for Amazon can be multiple things, but there are too many returns, too many refunds, or too many one-star reviews, um, sorry, feedbacks, I should say, not reviews. One-star feedbacks, that can mean the account is at risk of getting suspended. And once it's suspended, then you've got to take action to get it back. And that's that's hard to do. It can be done, but Amazon gets very busy. It can take them a long time to do that, it can lose you a lot of sales, right? So how can we do deal with that? Well, here's one simple strategy to deal with feedback. Um, I recently was in a position um, where I hadn't sold very much stuff because for a variety of reasons, I won't bore you with on one account in the USA, uh, one of my Seller Central accounts. And the, um, the result was that I'd only had 58 feedbacks within about 60 days or something along those lines. And then I had a, a negative feedback uh, from Tony One Star um, feedback, which was all about a product review and was basically just incorrect. But that's, that's kind of irrelevant from Amazon's point of view in some ways. Now, what happened is because that was one out of 58, that was about whatever, 1.6, 1.7% of my feedbacks were there for one star. And that actually meant that I got a warning from Amazon saying account at risk, which is like a heart stopping moment for any entrepreneur. So what did I do? Well, first of all, the immediate action if that happens to you is I, fortunately the um, feedback was in fact 100% about the product. So it was basically a product review, but in feedback, and that's absolutely against Amazon's own uh, regulations around what feedback's for, which is supposed to be about the, the customer service experience that the customers had. So I simply went to Amazon and said, this is basically a product review, it breaks your terms of service, and sure enough, they removed it, which is great, okay? But the thing that struck me is that I need to be more cautious about getting feedback, not as a way to increase any of my 
uh, reward, as it were, and the profits or sales, but as a way to mitigate risk, i.e. it's like an insurance policy. And this is the stuff that doesn't look very sexy until it happens and then suddenly it shows just how incredibly important it is. So what I want to do now is consciously, and I do now in my emails, have a follow-up sequence and consciously ask people for feedback a lot of which is gonna end up being a product review and then I'll go back to them in the traditional way and say, hey, could you turn that into a product review instead, please, you know, and just copy and paste it to them and all that good stuff, right? But in a lot of cases, I'm pretty happy just to have good feedback. Why is that? Because it gives me a cushion of positive feedbacks so that in any given period, if I get a one-star feedback from somebody because Amazon messes up and doesn't deliver stuff to them, and by the way, then it's not my fault, but if you get hold of Amazon, if they mess stuff up for your customer, Amazon will fess up and they will put a note on it, say well, they will keep the feedback, but it will say this was um, FBA and we made the mistake. And also they will remove that feedback in terms of, they won't remove the actual words, but they'll remove the, the weighting that the number gives to their uh, account health system. Hope that makes sense. So in other words, if anyone goes on to your feedbacks and bothers to read them, and hardly anyone does, they'll actually see the message. But if they just look at the average number of stars for feedbacks, and that, that won't count. And also more importantly, it won't count to damaging your account health. Hope that makes sense. Right, but also, um, even if it is a genuine complaint and everybody's messed up and that one star feedback, not review, feedback for my entire account sticks. If I've got like 200 positive feedbacks within the last 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is that Amazon measures, I can't remember which it is, but it's the same principle applies. And there's one one star feedback amongst a sea of four and five stars, then that means that, you know, if I've got say 200 four and five star feedbacks and one negative feedback is about 0.5% of my feedbacks, which means it's not gonna flag anything up with Amazon. It's not a problem. It doesn't threaten my account. Just continue as normal, right? So that is one very, very simple way that we can mitigate the risk. And there are other ways as well, which I'm not gonna detail all of them, but that is one thing that struck me from very recent experience, a very, very concrete and very real thing that struck me just how vulnerable we can be as Amazon sellers. But once we recognize that, we can do two things that are really, really appropriate. So I'll wrap up with this, a recap of what I've been saying. The first appropriate thing is to recognize we are dealing with a very high reward, but pretty high risk way of making money, and that's fine, but put it into an appropriate mix of other ways of making income, such that you have a balanced portfolio of investments, if you like, or businesses or income streams, whichever way you wanna look at it. And the second thing is, once we recognize there are risks, we need to find out what are they and have a plan to mitigate them, i.e. to reduce them as far as we can. And once you know what the risks are, you can get a plan in place and you can reduce them a great deal. And then you can start to reduce the risks, reduce the risks while keeping great rewards. And that is when you are really looking at a fantastic opportunity, right? If you want to know more in detail about all these things, I can't possibly go through everything right now, then it's the sort of thing you need to discuss in detail. It could be that you want to get yourself over to the mastermind. So once again, I'll remind you, it's amazingfba.com forward slash mastermind if you can get yourself to London once a month. I would say it's for you if you're based in the UK, but actually we have a couple of people in the mastermind. One of whom comes from Luxembourg and uh, another person comes from the south of France. They're both British or at least part British, but they uh, both make the effort and they combine it with other things and go and see things in London as well. Uh, London's obviously an amazing place to, to see people and uh, to take in a show or cultural events or to do business for that matter. So. Um, up to you, whatever works for you, but whatever you do, just keep yourself informed about the really important things and the realities of Amazon, and you will be in a great position to make absolutely the most of this still incredible opportunity. Thanks guys, speak to you in the next show.